This week, uh, really our final week of uh, homework and reading uh, before we have a week of reflection and giving folks a chance to catch up on writing and, 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 and going back over the lectures and reading. Uh, this final week is focused on uh, women, education, and social change. It's um, an important week because I think it, we, we have to remember, and we, we've seen this uh, echoes of this throughout the course, we have to remember that uh, gender is a category that makes an enormous difference whenever we're talking about any of the major global challenges uh, that we've been discussing in this class. Gender matters when you're talking about uh, poverty. Gender matters when you're talking about uh, health and disease. Gender matters when you're talking about climate change. Uh, uh, these global challenges affect men and women differently. What we see in the reading for this week is that um, paying attention to gender uh, is going to be helpful to men and women, uh, paying attention to gender, having a feminist approach to economic development uh, and uh, social, political uh, uh, development, having a feminist approach to those things uh, will benefit um, uh, everyone. Uh, and if one doesn't pay attention to gender, it's actually going to uh, hurt everyone uh, because women uh, have such an important role to play uh, in meeting these global challenges. So we'll, we'll start off just really reviewing. Uh, I'd like to just review some of the basic facts about uh, uh, the discrimination against women uh, in various parts of the world and the um, the differential experience uh, uh, or the different experiences that men and women have. We can start off um, uh, with uh, uh, literacy. Uh, over 80% uh, of uh, adult men uh, uh, achieve literacy, but it's, it's closer to, to two-thirds uh, uh, f for women in uh, low, what's called low human development uh, countries. It's, it's, it's even uh, worse. It's uh, over... 50% for men and just over a third for women. The uh, primary school experiences, uh, again, uh, many more men have access to education uh, at primary levels uh, than girls do, and um, uh, the differences get even greater uh, f uh, in developing countries uh, when you move on to secondary and tertiary uh, education. In terms of gross national product, uh, a measure that's important, uh, uh, although as we'll see this week, uh, uh, it shouldn't be overused. Men control uh, almost twice as much of gross national pro pro product uh, as women uh, in uh, medium development countries. Um, and um, uh, it really uh, it can get worse in um, uh, in the developing uh, world. We know that women uh, experience crime very differently uh, than men, um, and we know that uh, across the world, uh, domestic violence and rape is uh, an enormous problem, uh, changing the life experiences for uh, all women, uh, and not just for the victims of those crimes, but for women who feel they have to change their behavior so as um, not to be, become a victim uh, uh, of crime. So the lived experiences uh, for uh, men and women uh, across the world uh, are quite different. And in the countries that uh, are the most vulnerable to climate change, to health uh, issues, to uh, extreme poverty, um, the, the vulnerability is heightened for women. Uh, the vulnerability is greater for women. Um, and recognizing that actually allows us uh, to uh, take steps to address women's uh, need for uh, human and economic development. And when we do that, that has a uh, strong reverberation uh, 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 across the society, uh, affecting both men and women, uh, boys and girls. I'm so pleased to be here with Marion Pearl, Managing Director of Chime for Change's storytelling platform and lifelong passionate advocate for the right of girls and women to tell their own stories. So one of the recurring themes that we've been hearing over the last two days is how girls and women are key to progress and to economic development. 
But as recently as two years ago, only 6% of all funding went into the hands of girls and women. That's 6%. So a couple of us over at Women Delivered decided to take the matter into our own hands and do something about it. And we started to build a crowdfunding platform, a place where girls and women working on the front lines for justice could basically tell their stories in their own words, share their work, and find funding for their projects from a new online global audience. Marianne, um, we hear all the time about sharing stories in your own words. and. What, why is it more than a cat, catchphrase? Well, I think for me, um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah? okay. Uh, hi, everyone. And for, <laughs> first of all, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm happy, thank you, uh, uh, for inviting me. Because uh, we, we hear these words you know, of, uh, about women sharing the, their stories in their own words. And uh, um, to me, it means uh, more than a catchphrase. Because uh, when you think about it, having a story, for me, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a basic human right. Because as an individual, you need a story. You know, Having a story, belonging to a family, belonging to a country, belonging to, to a story, is part of, uh, of your integrity. And it's part of your, your dignity. And the, the first thing you did in history, for instance, when you uh, colonize a country, is to deprive them of the story. You know, that's how you control people. And if you think about it, uh, the way we've been taught history, women were not part of the story. And it's Virginia Woolf who wrote, I love this quote, who said, um, for most of history, anonymous was a woman. You know, and, 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 and it's, that's pretty much it. And nobody, none of us has been taught history from the perspective of women. Women were an afterthought of history, uh, the, like a irrelevant account of the human experience. So it's, a, it's a quite a serious topic, you know, of depriving people of their, of their stories, also depriving them of their ability to control their own lives and to make decisions. And that brings me to my second point, which is, you know, we, we all, you know, constantly being told stories. And everyone tells stories. Politicians tell stories. You know, if you want to start a war or end a war, you have to tell a story to justify what you're going to do. Uh, the media tells the stories all the time. Uh, religions tell the story. And all of those stories justify why we're making the, you know, the decisions we're making and how we're going to live accordingly. So, Having the right to tell your story is also having the right to, to, to steer the world in, in a certain way. And um, so, you know, being able to have your own narrative, to have your own perspective and your own anal analysis on what's going on is also your right to, to be able to make decisions and, 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 and gear the world in a certain way. So we know, I've, I mean, my opinion is that, you know, women's right is really about a power. It's about sharing power. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And the storytelling part is absolutely crucial when it comes to sharing power. And the third, uh, po uh, you know, important point for me is that those stories, you know, if they've never been told, imagine how much there is to say. And how, you know, like the, uh, you know, it's the, I've been reporting a lot uh, about women and that brought me to many, many countries where women had never told their stories. And they not only had, um, you know, the right to do so, but what they had to say was mesmerizing. And when I go to different uh, international, uh, you know, gathering and people say, oh, how do we change the world? How do we do this? And I listen to these women, they have the answers. They've walked the walk. They have the experience. They had incredible wealth of knowledge. Of, they know the context. They know the people they're dealing with. They know what justice is all about. And so we need to listen to them just because we need the solutions. And now, obviously, we also have the tools to do that, which you know, I'm turning the microphone back to you because you are Mrs. Tool. And, uh, and, but that's <laughs> Hopefully not why, that is basically, basically why I think storytelling is more than just, you know, uh, um, just a catchphrase. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> so Marion's right, we do have the tools and we think of the internet basically as the greatest blank check ever written. So we decided to take matters into our hands and to build a crowdfunding platform. And we were really energized by three principles in building it. The first principle is that it's all about listening to girls and women. As Marion said, they are agents of change in their own lives and they know how to make the change, but of course they need funds in order to do it. Secondly, we wanted to build something 
that really engaged with men. Because frankly, we just won't make enough progress if men are not going to stand with us on our issues. And lastly, and very importantly to us as individuals, we really wanted to be able to choose exactly where our money went. Nobody needs to make those decisions for us anymore. And 100% of our donations wanted to go straight to the ground, straight to girls and women. So we launched Catapult with some wonderful grassroots partners. Um, this is Roots of Health in the Philippines. And they provide family planning services in an area where everyone was pregnant and you couldn't see any flat bellies. They also teach sex education in schools. They gave us our first fully funded project. There they are, the staff of uh, Roots of Health, they're lovely. And the great thing is the story doesn't end there. Because we're a crowdfunding platform, they're now reporting back to all of their um, online supporters, telling them how the progress is going, what they were able to achieve. You can see it was a very small project, but they achieved real measurable impact for their communities. And these very small projects that we started out with actually served to attract some really cool and quite big partners, including Chime for Change, which is a new initiative, a major new initiative, founded by Gucci to empower girls and women. And Chime for Change, the centerpiece of Chime for Change, I'm going to go really fast, actually, though, so we can show you a quick video. But the centerpiece of Chime for Change was a concert. Um, it was the first global concert for girls and women, Beyonce and uh, Haim, Florence and the Machine. And there were 50,000 concert goers, all of whom, because of crowdfunding, got to choose exactly where their money would go. And because of this partnership, a really small organization like ours was able to have major significant impact in our first year and also major uh, new audiences really engaging with all of the issues that face girls and women around the world. So we're feeling really great about this. I just want to say Do that, you know, what was really, I went to the concert and Maz was there too. And what was really amazing is that people, you know, were going to a concert, they were having fun. And, and it was young, young, a lot of young crowd, but coming with their fathers, kids. coming with their brother, kids. And, you know, everybody felt great about celebrating helping women in the world. And it felt like the, you know, the face of development of, you know, international cooperation was changing and was, Cool, you know, this is the world. It was, it was, totally. it was changing, and it was, you know, and and everybody felt good about both celebrating and helping and having their money uh, going straight to organ to organization that would also tell them, you know, how how they were doing, and and this connection was incredible and it was tangible as well. So actually, we're going to end with. Um some of, uh, just very briefly, a couple of the projects that fully funded, thanks to Chime for Change, crowdfunded by Catapult, and they'll tell it in their own voices. Together, through an innovative partnership, we've crowdfunded more than 250 projects in 81 countries. My name is Shadra Mashidi, and I am 16 years old. Lovely. I've been leading a girls' leadership summer camp for the past three weeks. Today, we had each girl give a speech as though she was running for president of Afghanistan. Hello, my name is Arzu Salini and I am running for president of Afghanistan. If you choose to elect me, some of the things that I will support includes the biggest unsolved issue in our country, women's rights. When I joined this program, I learned that we could actually do something about it, that we could actually help. These girls, in the future, they could become something really great. We're supporting innovation and creativity. My name is Emily May. I'm co-founder of Hollaback, and we made an app to end street harassment. You can't say that street harassment doesn't matter when you look at that map and you see the extent to which it's happening on our streets and in our communities. Movements have always started because people tell their stories, and this app is just one more way that people can tell their stories so we can change the culture by changing the narrative. And what we hope is that ultimately we'll live in a world where there's no dots, and then I'll retire and go to the beach and drink a margarita. <laughs> It's all about listening to girls and women. They know how to create change. 
We are fighting for the right to be educated. We are elevating the next generation of women leaders. We are transforming lesbian and bisexual women's lives in Sri Lanka. We are empowering women in the Philippines to plan their pregnancies. We're bringing solar lighting to women and their families. We are helping secure land rights for women around the world. We are providing safe spaces for girls in Haiti. We are empowering communities to lead their own development. We are helping HIV positive women and children. We are saving Tanzanian babies. We are supporting the African women. We are attacking sex trafficking. We are putting an end to gender-based violence. Thank you. One of the most dramatic statements of uh, uh, paying attention to gender uh, in terms of uh, thinking about economic and human development uh, was made by Amartya Sen, who's author of one of the texts you're reading this week. Uh, uh, Amartya Sen, uh, an economist and uh, really philosopher and, and, and critic, uh, who uh, in 1990 published an essay on, uh, on the missing women, as he called it. He argued that uh, since the survival rates for uh, women uh, are greater than men, uh, uh, when you see uh, demographically that a society has uh, uh, f significantly more men than women, that is the result of actions, he argued, that um, cut the lives short of women, um, uh, or cut the lives short of girls, um, and and we don't act, perhaps see this action uh, except in the demographics. In other words, uh, uh, in in uh, uh, w without prejudice, uh, you would have about one hundred and one women f for every hundred men, uh, uh, given the survival rates uh, of. Uh, of uh, men and women across the road, uh, world. And in uh, industrialized countries, uh, you so see rates like that. But um, in much of the developing world, and he focused on Asia, uh, South uh, Asia and, uh, and, and China, you see 93 women uh, or so for uh, every 100 men. And Sen asked himself, what could be the cause of that? And um, uh, he argued that um, the cause was that female fetuses were being uh, aborted um, and, um, and girls uh, were not uh, cared for in the same way that boys are cared for, so that they die off more often, uh, they never reach adulthood, uh, because of prejudice. And so he argued that uh, in 1990 there were over 100 million missing women in Asia. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and this was a, a dramatic uh, concretization of the effects of prejudice. And economists and demographers have um, gone back over this, and there were some arguments about whether certain diseases might be uh, in play. But uh, uh, still today, Sen's uh, thesis stands. We see the effect of gender discrimination because we see there are girls who are just um, who die before reaching adulthood um, uh, or, or who are never born because of technology today allows families to find out the sex of uh, the, the baby to come and that there is a, a tendency in great parts of the world uh, to selectively choose uh, for male children. I would just give you a quote from Sen uh, from a recent uh, 2013 uh, reflection on missing women. Uh, Sen writes, a distressing aspect of gender bias in India that shows little sign of going away is the preference for boys over girls. One of the most pernicious uh, effects of this pro-male bias is the relatively higher mortality rates of girls compared with boys. Not because girls are killed, but mainly because of the quiet violence of the neglect of their health and illness in comparison with the attention that male children receive. Notice that phrase, quiet violence. Uh, that's what Sen put his fing fingers on. Um, in, in his demographic studies. Studies have shown, he writes, that m male priority in care continues for adults as well as children, raising the mortality rates of adult women above those of adult men.
So um, in uh, West Asia and North Africa, uh, in South Asia, and especially India, uh, and, and, and in uh, East Asia, especially in China, you see this very dramatically. Um, and for Sen, uh, a, a, a extraordinarily sad and challenging uh, manifestation of quiet gender violence.